Welcome everybody to the fifth virtual session running up to this year's digital edition of Jazz Ahead, which will happen from April 29th to May 2nd in Bremen. Today's topic is Brexit, what's jazz got to do with it? Uh, not only that the world had suffered from, uh, from uh, COVID over the last year, but on top of that, the UK left Europe two months ago. And we'll find out what, what is worse uh, and how it affects jazz. What does Brexit mean for British musicians who want to tour abroad, for foreign agencies and directors who want to hire British talent? For foreign musicians who want to tour the UK, uh, or for UK clubs and festivals who want to hire international talent. Questions we want to address in this session on a very practical level. Before introducing you to the panel, I want to let you know if you have any questions during the session, uh, please feel free to send them via chat and on Facebook via comment section and we will collect them and after the session we will have time to answer your questions. We also have prepared a fact sheet for you regarding our session today, so you will find the link uh, to that in the chat as well and on Facebook in the comment section. I will guide you through this session together with Sebastian Scottney, publisher and of the blog London Jazz News and for a long time already working for Jazz Ahead as well. Welcome. Sebastian, we'll share our questions. From London, we have Kim McCary. She's a trumpet player. She's a programmer of one of the most vibrant jazz venues in London, the Vortex. And she is a board member of Jazz Promotion Network, a national organization that replaced Jazz Services UK a couple of years ago. And she's part of Jazz Connective EU. EU, a European collaborative project between uh, different uh, European actors uh, built on sustainable strength, uh, sustainably strengthen uh, the artistic scenes by exploring these issues on a European scale. A project financed through Creative Europe from which the UK withdraw through Brexit. Is there any initiative re to replace Creative Europe? We'll come to these implications later. Plus, she's from Scotland, uh, where people voted the Brexit out. Another story, welcome, Kim. From Vienna, we have, but originally from England, we have Ian Smith. He is a promoter and event coordinator, programmer and activist in the world music and, and folk roots scene in the UK for more than 25 years, I think. He runs a company called Frusion, one of the companies he runs. It was Fruits as well, I think. Uh, Frusion, uh, which... Frusion. Uh, yeah, Frusion, uh, which basically is an agency. He gave a lot of lectures and workshops on how to deal with Brexit and cultural organizations. And he just came out of a meeting and a, and a uh, meeting of with the parliamentary meeting in, in the UK. Uh, but he is in Vienna, and you know why he's in, and he knows why he's in Vienna. I bet. Welcome, Ian. <laughs> Originally Hi. a drummer and an award-winning entrepreneur in the finance business, <coughs> crazy combination though, uh, Daryl Scheinman, uh, some years ago uh, built uh, something old-fashioned and analog like Gearbox which is a record company that basically deals with LPs, you know, this old vinyl stuff. Uh, so he's really involved in physical shippings and entrepreneur that he is. He found some ways to circumvene annoying bureaucracies acting out of Europe rather than out of the UK. He will tell us more about that in a minute. Welcome, Daryl. My first question goes to, to Ian. Uh, what is different now when a British band wants to hop on a van with all their gear stored in the van and make a two week tour through Europe? No problem. What's Thank different? you very much for inviting me to do the, the panel. Much appreciated. Um, well, first, one thing to say, we've not left, left Europe. We've left the EU, sadly. Um, the reality is that what happens now for a UK based artist or a UK based artist that has some Europeans in the group as well, which creates another complication, is that we now have to deal as third country nationals with up to 27 different uh, regimes because all the countries are sovereign as they always have been. Um, and each of those regimes has different uh, rules for work permits, sometimes people call them visas sometimes they call them other things so the reality is to navigate that in terms of a tour 
you have 27 different regimes. Germany is great, allows up to 90 days in any um, one year period free. That includes crew and support staff as well. Um, France is similar. And the Netherlands have just announced six weeks and only 13 weeks free. But Spain is nothing. Um, uh, Portugal, nothing. You cannot go there without a work permit. So that's the work permit issue. But the other problem, of course, that we will all have to deal with in both directions are carnets, which will be necessary for moving equipment around. Not merchandise, just equipment. And you must have a carne for temporary import and export. And on top of that, of course, we all have to pay um, for merchandise if you're carrying it with you across the Schengen border, not within the Schengen area. Um, you'll have to pay VAT and import duty um, and have an EORI number for being able to trade in the EU. So it's not exactly as easy as it was. <laughs> um, it's going to be much more difficult logistically. It's going to add costs. And then for promoters in the EU, I know as an agent myself, we're going to be negotiating for backline um, to be included in any shows, which will add cost to the promoters. And whether or not the promoters then want to feel they want to ha have that added cost and complication, that is also going to create a barrier to touring in terms of being able to still be there. The one thing I would say to finish my piece on this is that we will all still be able to tour, but with greater levels of difficulty. And sadly, in some countries, because there is no freedom of uh, a work permit, then those countries will be less likely to be toured in until such time as there's some sort of side deal put in place. So logistics, cost, administration, none of which we had before then, um, all added complications. The one other thing to say, and that's really important, this is to the musicians out there, of course, there are unintended consequences as well, like the CETES regulations on um, rare, rare woods and endangered species. So if your instrument has anything in it like rosewood or ebony or ivory, then you need a certificate because before now you wouldn't be checked at customs coming into Schengen or the other way. But of course you will be now. A certificate's free, but you have to make sure your instrument's covered. Otherwise it could be confiscated permanently. So there you go in a nutshell. Everything's fine, but <laughs> we've got well, if you if you're to America you have to have this certificate anyway as well. So yes, uh, exactly those artists who are internationally uh, underway uh, they know these uh, these things I think. Uh, Daryl it's you uh, yeah you you transport goods so uh, you have different different attitude with uh, uh, when you tour, when you transport them within the EU. Yeah, I mean, the, well, it's, I mean, the trouble with all of this is that we haven't had any time um, to figure out what's going on because they're all closed, as we know, right at the end of the year. And um, so we're all still figuring it out. Even if we think we know what we're doing, we don't. Um, but I think the good news on that is that it's not really any different, which is important. There are important export duties still. I mean, we manufacture our vinyl uh, at... Uh, two or three places, Toyo in Japan, um, uh, Optimal in Germany, and uh, Vinyl Factory in the UK, but, and, and hand-drawn in America. <laughs> Let's ignore um, anywhere non-European, because uh, that's actually, funnily enough, quite straightforward. You just use your Iori number, and it's OK. Um, and the issue with Europe, of course, is that it's changed now. Um, in terms of everything we export. So if we sell records um, for our artists over Bandcamp uh, or our Shopify direct sales website, we have to now, when we post everything out, uh, fulfill, we have to do customs declarations for everything. Um, and that is uh, a pain. So uh, it's not sufficient now to just enclose a delivery note containing this information with the consignment. We now have to um, do a customs invoice um, which is a pain and of course everything's subject to customs duties but that will be charged back accordingly um but in terms of actual movement of products across borders that's slightly interesting um because the export declarations are declarations what of what's being exported um from the eu 
and uh, our pressing plant, Optimal, declares the uh, export um, <clears throat> in the custom system, which is known as Atlas, and provides um, all the accompanying documents, um, you know, including our EORI number and contact details, etc. And then the freight forwarder heads to the border with these documents and um, moves the, from the EU uh, to the Office of Export. And then after it's been exported, the forwarder's got to travel to the imports customs office uh, in the UK and declare the um, uh, pre-announced imports of the goods so that they can enter into the UK. And uh, that's often done by the forwarder. But in order for that to happen without them contacting us, we have to give power of attorney to Optimal and their forwarder to do it on our behalf. Otherwise, it gets really messy. So these are the sort of complications that have happened since. Yeah. There was one thing that came up. Um, I mean, I, I mentioning, but are you supposed to mention Hamburg? You blame them. There was a, 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 a very similar conversation a few days ago on the site of the Reeperbahn Festival. And what they were saying about your industry, Daryl, is that kind of deadlines and um, delivery dates are generally suspended for the moment because of difficulties in um, in all sorts of things. I suppose that's partly to do with factories operating at fractions of capacity and the COVID effect. But is that something, I mean, are you finding that, that you're still able to respect delivery dates or where are you with that now? Uh, very good question. And in fact, <laughs> um, for small for vinyl, it's gone out um, enormously. We're looking at 20-week turnaround times now um, for a pressing run, whereas we were prior to, well, prior to COVID, and then obviously Brexit has added uh, complications, so we've had a few weeks added from that as well. We were looking at six to eight weeks, so it's a significant change yeah uh, and it's very hard for a label to, you know we we sign an act and they want when when an artist has finished recording in the studio and it's mixed and mastered they kind of want it out they're moving on to the next project mentally uh, artistically and creatively and they want this thing out and even before all these problems of brexit and the pandemic they were impatient and now it's terrible <laughs> We've got to try and convince them to really uh, be patient and especially because it's a label uh, because uh, Ian said there's no touring. The, the problem is they're really reliant upon the label now to um, provide a significant wedge of, of their income, which puts us under pressure. But yet we've got, you know, it's going to take longer. So it's all, yeah, it isn't good. It, this needs Can to I ask check. a question, Sebastian? A very important question, I think. Given what you just said about pressing um, and ironically exporting and re-importing, so if you've got a pressing plant in Europe, in the EU, are you able to uh, deliver to your clients for, say, physical distribution or artists, if they're if a UK artist going to the EU, can they pick their product up there via you? So do you have an EU-based distribution centre? Yes. That's for Daryl, is it yeah. a question? Got it. That's Darryl. for Daryl. Sorry, my yes. apologies. <laughs> yeah. Oh, right. Sorry, I thought you said for Sebastian. <laughs> yeah. no, 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 sorry. No, 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 no. no. I know my limitations. <laughs> I definitely know my limitations. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Obviously, if you're having it pressed in yeah. the EU, yeah. can you not leave it in the EU for people to collect? Yes, that's... As yeah. Well? yeah. So that definitely happens too. So we um, have a German VAT number and a German address, which so when things are pressed in Germany and leave the factory gate in Germany, we deal with it as if we're a European company, if it's going to somewhere else in, in Europe. Yeah, so that's really handy. And I, I would advise uh, lab, other labels, other companies to do the same. It, it, it's a bit of a hassle. You need to have a, a, an accountant who in, in Germany who can do all your stuff. So there's additional fees for that, of course. Yeah. But at least you can get it right with that person doing it for you because the tax office in Germany everything's in German, so unless you speak German. So anyway, there are a number of complications, but yes, that is a very important thing to do. And um, logistically, it's the only way, really, I think. Yeah, it's for general merch as well, because there's now been a lot yeah. of um, background noise between the merch companies about doing reciprocal things across in from UK, EU, having them made in the UK, made in the EU, and then reciprocating. So no, thank you. I thought that was the case, but wanted to raise the point. Yeah, we're even actually thinking of having um, 
a, a German, a local company do direct to fan fulfillment as well of, of records um, so that they don't yeah. even have to come via the UK. Kim, how the uh, the clubs affected uh, in uh, in f by by Brexit uh, with European talent with uh, British talent that's that's normal but but with uh, European uh, musicians. Well, yeah, of course. I mean, up until uh, recently, the kind of um, there were cost implications of bringing. Um, American artists to work with us, uh, not not just in terms of the um, the work the work permit, but also to do with um, the the ways in which different countries kind of value the arts more broadly, and as a result, the fees that can be paid to those artists. So, um, for for myself as a programmer, an American artist would appear kind of um, on a maybe a once a season basis um, to make that work uh, financially. And to add now to that, Europeans as well, uh, really cuts out our ability to, well, to bring kind of a diverse range of talent to, to work in the UK. So if you look at the history of the Vortex, you look across the programmes, you'll see um, lots and lots and lots of European uh, bands touring, as well as collaborations that, that are born out of um, people touring and coming to the UK and meeting other musicians. So for that now to be... For European bookings to now be placed in that same category as the US it is really going to impact our ability to kind of showcase talent um, and for I think not just for the Vortex but for lots of other venues we feel a responsibility to play a part in someone building their international career so we would often showcase talent that would be working uh, in the UK for the first time um, and to be able to do that financially and to help them start to grow a fan base. It now just shifts everything up a little bit more. And what it means is it becomes increasingly difficult if you don't have um, management or an agent working on your behalf. Um, the grassroots uh, scene is really affected, um, which is which is really sad in terms of how we see the art form develop. We kind of raise that bar as high as it can be raised. Can I, can I jump I, in here, please, Peter? Yeah. It's really important because I just want to uh, reiterate what Kim said, but there's one ray of light in all of this for EU musicians. And that is, although they'll still have to deal with carnets and merchandise, etc., cetera, the, um, there's been a lot of misinformation over the last few weeks about this in the UK and across media generally. The UK had agreed... Um, has agreed, and it's on the websites, um, that there is a 90-day exemption for EU creatives. It's 90 days, not 30. And also what those creatives are going to require, other than the carnet and everything else, all they will need is a certificate of sponsorship from a UK sponsor mm. like myself. But not all venues, etc., do that. They're going to need a certificate of sponsorship, which is decided by the sponsor, not the government or the borders agency. So I can just give one. Uh, I take responsibility for that, by the way. But also they're going to have to show either a letter from their sponsor saying that we'll support them for one month or £1,270 in a bank account statement. So in actual fact, the work permit thing is actually relatively easy and relatively low cost because the cost for a sponsor may be 20, 30, 40 pounds per person. But in that sense, it's very good news in some ways for EU creatives in that they're not going to require, all they need is a, is a sponsor in the UK. And then there are lots of us around um, and some even some venues are now talking about doing this although it's a pain in the butt to actually register with the UK borders and you're responsible, of course. So that's the one ray of light in all this for EU creatives coming into the UK and also for promoters, etc. And then there's just the extra cost with backline, etc. Sorry, I thought it was important to say. No, I think that's a really interesting point and a really practical point because, I mean, the temperature of the debate, I, I, I wrote a long, quite long blog article for Jazz Ahead's blog, which was kind of taking yeah. in 
um, impressions from musicians and also from managers and so on. I mean, I, I, I'm not as deep into this as Ian is, but it, it's a, a piece that kind of reflects a bit on the time. And I, when I started writing it, um, that independent story hadn't kind of raised the temperature. I mean, I, when I was reading people's year end statements and nobody, but they just weren't talking about Brexit. And sort of since the 10th of January, the political heat into this debate has gone on. And um, one of the things that I've been aware of from a number of people that I've spoken to just in the run up to this session today is the idea of lobbying and campaigning and what needs to get changed and, and that kind of thing. And, and I think what you're saying, Ian, is that for certainly from the side of EU people coming to the UK, there's not really, in, in spite of our you know, Home Secretary, who has a particular views on immigration and, and a particular inability no to cons construct cons complete sentences. Um, but the, you know, we have, there is a certain amount of anger around about all of those things. But I think what you're saying is that, that this might be one area where the lobbying and the changing and the let's try and renegotiate doesn't actually lead anywhere because there is something workable there already. Or am I wrong? There's, I'll, I'll answer that really clearly. I've actually been in touch over the last few days with um, musician, um, the um, General Secretary of Musicians Union, uh, also Parliament, etc. Um, and there is a big, big um, uh, thing coming up now where people haven't really clearly seen this. In Parliament, MPs have been saying the UK offered 30 days, the EU 90 days, we did this, they did that, whatever. The reality... The real reality of the situation now, having spotted this a few days ago, is that the UK government have insisted on a certificate of sponsorship, which they don't, the borders agency don't need to agree on. We do. There's a piece of, uh, it's not a piece of paper, it's a number actually. But if we can get rid of the requirement for a certificate of sponsorship, the EU and the UK have offered exactly the same thing. They've offered a 90-day exemption in the UK and the EU have offered a 90-day exemption throughout Schengen. So if we can get to that point, because as I said, all through the press everywhere, they've been saying that UK 30 days, EU 90 days. There's an, an argument not to reopen the agreement because no one is going to do that. It's mm. about a side deal. And if we can at least remove that requirement for a work permit or visa it reduces costs for everybody it reduces hassle for everybody and then we're not going to clearly move on goods on vat import duty that's not going to happen not for a very very long time the carnet situation possibly for personal instruments so we remove one of the three barriers to simple movement of and trade because we've also made the argument very clearly that musicians in particular and artists actors whatever maybe different for actors musicians generally pop over to do two or three shows or a short tour they're doing short-term work on a very specific way not like fruit pickers or which are sometimes are needed for temporary seasonal work it's quite unique. Bob Geldof did said this the other day. Fish from Marillion said this the other day in various interviews. The reality and Horace from the MU, they're short term bits of work that we all need to do. If we can get rid of at least the beginning of this, that's the visa requirement, work permit requirement, COS requirement. Both the EU and the UK can save face. Well, then go back to the table and say, ah, OK, we're not so far away from each other. So that's what I'm trying to say. But I won't start to talk about cabotage and moving around with lorries. Yeah, well, let's, that's well, another let, issue. Well, I always have that thing. If we, if we get onto cabotage and VAT too deeply, the audience will be evaporating pretty quickly. Um, <laughs> I have to say, I did actually conduct a Twitter poll this morning. And 56% um, at the last time I looked at it of people wanted the issues of visas and, um, and 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 work permits discussed above all so ian just a big you big up you because you're doing a fantastic job there Thank i mean you. while we're talking there's actually a, a um, we've had an inquiry 
from Helsinki with a complete with an exclamation mark as tends to happen from Helsinki. How would you say a quartet of two British, one Norwegian and one, I love the Finns, uh, one Finnish musician be treated as far as performing in the UK, lots of international projects, various internationals, would, would that make a good difference or are all the musicians going to be considered individually by the regulations? I mean, that kind of the idea, I know I've been talking to uh, managers of bands that are crossing borders. Um, Ian, maybe you've got a thought on that. Yeah. I can answer that very simply. Yes. <laughs> That's the answer. They're all going to be treated they're all going to be treated individually. They have to be because they're citizens of each country. If you're an EU citizen, you're covered by Maastricht Treaty, which allows you to have EU citizenship on top of your ordinary citizenship. So for use and work in the EU, you're considered an EU citizen, complete freedom of movement to work and live. Although after 90 days, you still have to report to the authorities, even if you're an EU citizen. If you're coming into the UK, then you're a Finnish citizen, a Norwegian citizen, and obviously the two UK ones would be able to work anyway without any restrictions. Um, but I do one thing, a little bit of a plug. There's a, the free information site I started a year ago because I knew this was going to happen. Um, we update this very regularly as well as the YouTube channel, and there are sections on EU, um, UK, etc. I'm not doing cabotage, though. Sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> We're not going there. Uh, so the reality no is... Sabot that, no sabotage. Yeah, no cabotage. Oh, sabotage or cabotage. <laughs> okay. But the Norwegian, that's a very good question because there are many artists and bands that are of mixed nationalities, both UK nationals, EU nationals, uh, e -E, um, e -T, what is it? ETA nationals, you know, the, the like uh, Liechtenstein or I know not many, not many. Vatican. Yeah, I mean, and they're in Switzerland, although they're part of the trade area, they're not actually part of the EU. So there are complicated rules. But the bottom line is each person is treated as though they're a national of their own country. UK citizens can continue to work amongst the common travel arrangement, otherwise known as Belfast or Good Friday Agreement in UK and Ireland. That's not changed. Um, Irish musicians are in a very, very good position if they have citizenship because they can work everywhere. Um, just to add to that, Ian, um, I think Mina's question, and I predict a lot will be similar, have kind of two sides to them, don't they? They have the side which is about uh, logistics and facts and how we negotiate the situation that we're in now but I think there's also uh, there's an element of the kind of longer term cultural impact of these things because yeah. the question of how is this going to be negotiated you know there's a real risk then that as, as Ian said before, these, these numbers of barriers that are added um, are going to affect people's decision-making, certainly about working and collaborating. So it may well be yeah. that people opt not to do that those projects um, because of the kind of added uh, complications Hassle. that that might bring. And, and there's, there's also some... From, sorry, uh, a really important Charlie point. Evans. I've just had one from okay. uh, the chat. T Permitted paid engagement visas in the UK... Yes. Not Tony, necessarily. Don't, Not don't necessary. go there because you have the, you now have the exemption, which is published on our website. So up to 90 days in any um, 180, according to the exemption with a certificate of sponsorship, you do not need a permitted paid engagement visa. You don't have to pay for anything, just the certificate of sponsorship. Sorry, that's really important. My apologies for inter interrupting. No, that's what I've been noticing. I mean, is, is that people, um, I mean, in that Brexit piece that I wrote, I mean, there was one agent who said to me, um, people are just going to be more reluctant to book UK musicians. And also, there's this question of whether a European tour, you know, once we get back to European tours, will actually include or exclude the UK because the additional costs. I mean, it's shifted, everything has shifted the break even points against things happening. I mean, this is an, I mean, I, this is an astonishing astonishingly creative community and I spoke in my in preparing for that thing for to a couple of people the most entrepreneurial people I've ever come across who are always organizing big tours and things and for the moment they're they're kind of their foot is off the gas because there's nothing to organize I, and I and what I'm understanding from I mean just generally because of other things that continental festivals are generally looking at lower um, artist rosters at reining thing, things back in and that that kind of thing so I mean there there are it may be a lot of these problems. These are problems which will probably only surface 
over over time i'm yeah. just you know once once things you know do start reviving again and people actually try i mean i get the impression that people aren't really for the moment for obvious reasons just not even trying to organize stuff and when you talk to some of the people who really normally are just at it and non-stop who are just saying well, we can't you know this ain't going to work for the moment um, is that is that more think, Brexit related or or or, or pandemic? Or COVID, related? yes. I think it's pandemic related. I, I, I mean, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, I think it's, it's a lethal combination of yeah, COVID is. and uh, yeah. And I Brexit. think the frustration is though that we obviously knew the outcome of the vote um, a very long time ago now, and like Sebastian says, the community, the arts community, is entrepreneurial <coughs> and will will weather lots of storms and we'll figure out ways to do it. But we've wasted years of time. We're, we're now, we're gonna to have to handle problems as they arise, when in fact they could have been predicted because if there was consultation with people, we could have flagged exactly these points that we're now experiencing. And then the frustration has come that the deal has been announced at the same time as a global pandemic. So now, like Daryl says, we've had no time to, to deal with any of these things and they keep coming at us. So we're always on the back foot. And that is the responsibility of government who took so long to make this decision. It wasn't as if the negotiations could have only started when they did is that Absolutely. they took years of time to start them it's very um, reactive, it's all very reactive rather than proactive now and that's mm. i think yeah which yeah, I mean, there's a tone of frustration. I mean, not. I mean, as I think, you know, from the the way that we're living in the UK and just being, the you know that the 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 death count every day and what our hospitals are facing and the whole all of that and and a, a government that has other things seems to have other things on its mind. I mean, there is an underlying anger, which I mean, they literally in the last 24 hours, this business of the PRS. I've had a couple of calls from people and I'm sure all of us have been talking about that. It's a kind of just the elephant in the room today is, you know, I mean, we, we've all, we all know that costs might increase. I mean, I've certainly paid um, customs charges and handling charges on a CD that was sent to me, but you know, the, the, what the PRS, the thing, and, and just, I would recommend anybody just to go on to Facebook and Twitter today and just look at the reaction of musicians to the PRS thing is, I'm just wondering if one of the panelists wants to, talk to that one yeah maybe you okay. should you uh, maybe you uh, talk a bit about um, what what prs now is suggesting suggesting especially for the streaming i see kim's hand was going up so please yeah sure so yeah, yeah so the prs announcement is to do with the licensing that's going to be um connected to digital streaming so obviously it's a again it's a it's a reaction to the fact that there's a massive amount of digital content um, because there can be no physical uh, performances um obviously that's been under discussion for for quite some time where they've realized this is a this has become a a, a pattern um, however, it's quite hard not to see the decision as kicking an industry when it's down. Because the thing to remember is that lots of venues operate on tiny, tiny break-even points where they're hovering on something working or not working. And so, yes, when you look at a single figure, you think, well, is that really going to push you one way or the other? But the reality is it will push some venues one way or the other. Um, and obviously, I'm an artist, and so a performing rights uh, society Clearly, I feel, you know, I want to be uh, remunerated properly for my work. On the other hand, it's quite difficult to see the timing um, and the delivery of information um, doesn't sit right at all, you know, and it feels a little bit like um, there's there's no alternative. Um, so we're kind of, we're, we're trapped in this position. I, I mean, I have but, one but inquiry. Uh, uh, well, I have a question. Uh, does PRS charge... Uh, want to charge uh, paid streams only or uh, even free streams? Can I, can I answer that? Because I've, I've, yeah, I actually yeah. was on a PRS meeting with various others as part of a conference a couple of weeks ago. This was not said exactly, but it was flagged up. And I could see the writing on the wall there it would eventually happen. So the, rea the, the argument is, of course, we're trying to collect royalties on behalf of musicians, <laughs> Kim's point. <laughs> yeah. But we're also mm -hmm. trying to not penalise musicians exactly, because mostly it's people doing it from home. There are many venues, of course, trying to do this as well. But the actual uh, rate card on this, I looked at it yesterday when I saw the announcement. I think it's £22.50 for if you're earning less than £250. And I can't remember, 30-something up to 500 And then anything over £500 revenue, 
um, it, please call us. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. we're all going to do that. Um, I've had a long history of P with PRS involvement for many years. For eight years, I was actually national chair of one of the MU sections, Folk Roots section. I used to work with the jazz section quite a lot as well. And um, there are many stories, including a PRS calling you up whilst you're in your office. And if you had your radio on in the background in your office... They'd be saying, do you have a yeah. license for that, sir or madam? Um, and okay, of course, you say, well, it's not open to the public. Well, do people walk into your office? I mean, it gets this. It, it's mm. crazy. Um, it's. I can see the argument for it. I can see why. But now, really? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. That's the problem. I mean, PRS is just for UK-based organisations, obviously, and you've got your own collection societies around the world. But it's a really bad timing. It's extremely yeah. bad in di diplomacy terms. And it's like, really? And of course, how? I'm not suggesting anyone should not get one, but how is this going to be policed at the end of the day? Yeah, absolutely. Um, but I think it's one thing that they introduce uh, a license that, that deals with digital streaming. I think that's fine and they definitely should yeah. do that. But when Absolutely. you look at the increase in what they charge for normal, like for physical performances, and they've chosen to increase by such a large amount, um, that feels like a very difficult decision to justify in anything other than them profiting. Yeah, and the problem is it's, it's going to, sorry, just, and it's going to subjugate people who are worried about this and they're worried anyway. And the mental health is suffering due to the lockdowns. So you've got people going, oh shit, I need a license or otherwise I can't stream. Oh, what, what do I do? Mm. That's, that's the big problem. Sorry. I'm just thinking, I mean, as I say, I come back to a question that I have been asked quite a lot, which is, you know, a motive is just motivating people to try and get things, specific things changed. And I guess that is one that there probably will be a, a campaign about. I mean, I had one promoter who suggested to me that, that basically if you declare your event to be a private event, like effectively a house concert, um, then and you are only having invited guests rather than no advertising it to the public. So we're, we're, we're in the US. No difference. It's still oh, really? a stream. Yeah. yeah. It's still okay. a stream. It's, still, it, it's even yeah. through invited guests, you've got people coming to enjoy the music. So as far as the PRS are concerned, it's still a stream. And they're just trying to replace revenue they're losing that would yeah. normally come into publishers, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, exactly. from playing in a venue. Um, so because no one's playing in venues. Um, so that's why the t that's why this timing seems off, but the timing is probably linked to this to the reason as well. So it's a little bit weird. It, it, it can look like really like profiteering and poor diplomacy, but I suspect it's it, it, it's a dichotomy, isn't it? It's yeah. 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 Part of, part of the, the kind of cultural background that we're developing in the UK is that we have a government which comes out with rules. And then there is a public outcry and you have a U-turn and you have one after another after another. I think, you know, we've seen you know, I mean, there was there, there, there just have been, you know, that the moment it becomes uh, a decision by our government, it becomes lampooned in popular press. Then suddenly, whoop, you find that they've changed it. And I suppose I keep in mind uh, just what if, uh, just generally to the to you as panel members, what. You, what could be changed? What actually needs to to happen? I mean, I suppose part of it is is the um, the self employed status of musicians and the number of people that we all know who've kind of escaped through nets or who who've, who've no, sorry have escaped through who've not been had any um, um, salary replacement or anything available to them, and also that thing of people who are the story that doesn't get out of people who have just gone and done other things away from music and who are kind of lost to the industry. That's part of our story at the moment, isn't it, Kim? Yeah, yeah. yeah it's absolutely part of our story. And um, I think, you know, it, we're moving back to this point where to survive and work in the creative world will require you to come from a wealthy background um, in order for you to, you know, it, it, we're just closing all the doors to this, you know. And I think when we look at practical, like to to your point, Sebastian, about the U-turns. On the one hand, it's heartening to see that there is that, that voices are being listened to and people are exercising their right to um, share their views and have things changed in government. However, the, the process by which that's done is just so wildly inefficient because they, they make the, the wrong decision first without consultation. So I think it's really important to remember, and I think this is the ultimate thing that we have to look at in terms of what needs to be changed. We need to change our government. 
because our government <laughs> doesn't our government doesn't doesn't you know it doesn't respect arts and culture and that's been made you know patently clear and while we can negotiate issue by issue to start to really try and prize things apart to make it workable they're never going to change their ideology if indeed they have one to um, respect the arts so until we move to a different system of government that does respect the arts we're going to be continually in this kind of micro negotiation process and we're never going to get any kind of actual systemic change yeah 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 i would absolutely echo that there was something fantastic i can't remember which i think it was one part of the right i'm trying not to say right wing rag press but it was part of the right wing press the other day that said we were going to be in negotiations for the next 50 years changing things from i think it was the telegraph or something i didn't read it i just saw the thing the thing is about is to move it slightly away from an uk centric point kim is absolutely right because once we change things in the uk it will open whatever this change of government or a change of party or whatever it will open up the negotiation process that needs to happen with the eu to allow a closer alignment with the eu because we were all talking about brexit at the end of the day and it's inevitable, absolutely inevitable, because of geography and because of uh, shared values and shared needs in the EU and the UK, that closer alignment will happen ever more over the next few years. The problem is, in the meantime, we have musicians in the UK, because they've been dropped through the, the net, stacking shelves in supermarkets, driving lorries, doing whatever they can to survive, which has always been the case, but even more so now. Um, through COVID and now through Brexit. We've got a double whammy there. So we've got Brexit making us more local and not allowing us to travel across mm. borders. And we've got COVID, obviously the promoters, et cetera, saying, well, we're going to book local. And then we've got a two-stage process, and that's natural, of course, and sensible that we can't be sure as a promoter if you've got people who can travel from Italy to Austria or Germany to France or whatever. So we've got this two-stage process where there's going to be a, a pressing down of the ability to, of promoters to book artists outside their own areas. And then on top of that, you've got the Brexit problem, which is, as I said earlier, there are bits of this we can deal with relatively quickly, like the work permits and visas. But it's going to be a gradual process. And in the meantime, we've got UK artists who are well and truly depressed that is the engine room of the industry for sebastian and everybody else merchandisers crew technicians it's a huge industry massive we've got an industry on both sides of the divide where this needs to be sorted out it has to be sorted out because we're ending up with a massive problem one little thing i'll say which is important to my my passionate speech at the moment i won't promise i won't speak for long on it cabotage honestly <laughs> is i i watched a very long video of an hour long which i posted on my facebook channel of totally about hauliers and if you can get past the jargon the reality is in the UK, we have 1,000 specialist lorries. These are for bigger tours, of course, but also relevant for smaller artists. We have 1,000 specialist lorries in the UK for music, etc. In the EU as a whole, there are 150. <laughs> because of the new rules on cabotage, those 1,000 lorries can't easily work in the EU at the moment, and vice versa, because... All the agreements that happened recently destroyed a 1959 agreement that allowed all this to happen easily. The law, <laughs> the deal, overwrote all that. And because it's a level playing field, the EU can't do things and the UK can't do things. So it, it will eventually change, but these are all aspects yeah. of the things that are pushing the whole industry down. Thank you, Ian. There is a question on Facebook from, from Jasper Hoby uh, about permits for EU musicians in the UK. Is it possible to get sponsored somehow to avoid the red tape? Spont as in? I think that's returning to the previous question about... Sponsorship, yeah, where you, you um, have to show that you've got bank money in the bank account. Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, I think that... Just it's not big money right so i suspect the aunt my answer to that would be perhaps uh, you know uh, a label can help with that perhaps as part of an advance <clears throat> there's a there's a number of solutions i think there 
Well, the government have actually said, and um, the culture minister has actually said in response to a lot of this that's happening over the last few days, that the government are willing, and they put this down in writing, willing to help financially um, for the cost of carnets and work permits. However, they've not said how they're going to do that. And they are not saying in reality how long they'll do that for. In reality, it is small in terms of the admin and the costs for a certificate of sponsorship for UK EU musicians coming into the UK, but it's easily thrown away and we can go to a point where in both directions we can do, um, uh, we can have permit free work. Uh, Ros Rigby is just uh, from Sage, an old friend has just posted something on the chat. Can I advise on how to overcome some of it? Well, there are ways <laughs> you can source backline in your local, wherever you are, you can, do swaps but there are elements of that that's that would take about a day so i'm going to shut up <laughs> yes there are ways we, we we you know we had a band a couple of years ago a folk trio which we signed and, and they came over from america and various countries and what as part of the tour support arrangement as a label um you know we essentially paid them a salary uh in return for you know in advance against the um income from each uh, venue because yeah, they didn't yeah. credit risk against the venues and whatever else um, so i good you know the, the the threshold for the amount in the bank account actually is lower than what we were paying them as a salary so i don't think that this is a you know answering jasper's question i don't think if you've got a label anyway or management or whatever or some sort of tour support arrangement i don't think this is going to be a showstopper no, no, no. And importantly, you can just have whoever's bringing you over saying you'll support them for one month whilst they're there. And that obviates the need for the £1,270 in banks. So then you just need a cause and a letter of invitation stating that you will support the artist whilst they're over for the first month. So in this, in essence, no. So in that, in the simple sense, until things change, that is relatively easy to get around as long as you have a UK sponsor. Yeah. Is there anybody uh, who does really profit from Brexit? <laughs> oh, that's a good question. <laughs> Shall we start talking about hedge fund managers? <laughs> disaster capitalism? No, I bet not. Um, there's, there's just no, been, not uh, cabotage, no, no hedge fund. No. no, as a question, Peter, um, is sponsorship per venue or per tour? Sponsorship is yeah. per period of time you're over in the UK, and it can be for multiple entry. So if you get a certificate of sponsorship from a UK sponsor, it's for a period of time. So you can have it for one month, one week, three months, and you can either have it as a single visit sponsorship or multiple entry, which means if the sponsor gives you a certificate of sponsorship for three months and a multi-entry, you can come in any, however many times you like within that one period. There you go, that's an answer to a question on the chat. Okay. Kim, will you go back to Scotland or... Um... <laughs> that's a good question so, what, yeah. what <laughs> like, like in what said, situation would we, would you go back to, to scotland when they read you on the eu <laughs> yeah exactly. i mean it, yeah it's an interesting position to be in um uh to uh to be a displaced scot um during this uh time so yeah obviously the uh scotland as a nation voted to remain in the eu um and so there's obvious uh uh tension about where we where we've ended up now as you'll see today Boris Johnson has opted to um visit Scotland um to try to convince um Scotland Sorry, not to have another independence referendum uh, Nicholas Sturgeon told him that that wasn't essential travel but he's decided to come anyway um like like it often is you know one of the best campaigners for Scottish independence is in fact Boris Johnson, Boris Johnson. um so will I go back to Scotland? You know, I would love to, Peter, and I feel like my um, my kind of political leanings are probably more at home there. Uh, but I've made, you know, a, London and, and cities around, you know, around the world are hubs for creativity for lots and lots of reasons. And I made the decision to, to come and to work here. And I've, you know, I've spent the last few years traveling around the world and working in London. And I really treasure those experiences. Uh, on the one hand, it would be nice to see kind of the decentralized um, artistic scene that spread across lots of places. I mean, Scotland's great, it's got lots of space. Um, and, and maybe we will see this movement, but I do, I sort of resent having to make that decision because I'm uh, being nudged out, if you like. 
Yeah, I think that spirit of kind of just wanting to be around the creative um, hubs and that, and, and I, I mean, in preparing that piece, I wrote, I mean, everything that I do, I mean, the, the positivity and the solution, problem solving ways and the ways of reinventing that I find in this community are something that inspire me every day of my life. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, you know, the people are going through very hard times, but if there's one community that can that has the kind of mental spirit just to kind of reinvent and to share and to do things right i you know there are some wonderful people in this community i, I was just i just listened all this morning writing a piece about um, leonardo pankovic of moon june and just just um, um, in, in just falling back in admiration as to what that guy must get done in a single day you know and with your scottish background i mean the the the, the natural force that is tommy you know the kind of the energy that mm. there is there I, I, if I, want, I wanted, because there is so much terrible things around, and before Peter sort of brings this thing to a proper close, I just want to salute the energy. And I can see you know, people like Heidi Fleming in Montreal or, or um, in Aditka, or there are some wonderful roles and so on. I mean, the energy that there is to support this sector and the fact that people are here today is really heartwarming and we kind of know that if there are solutions if there are ways that things can get fixed these are the people that we have around us who are going to find them it's all can about improvisation that, isn't it yeah Ian? can i just add, add to that i really really absolutely utterly uh, completely agree with everything sebastian said we're adaptable that's what creatives are and in a sense that's what the government have depended on in the uk Oh, well, they're adaptable. They can survive. They can work around it. Being as I am dual based, because I'm actually UK and Austria, Vienna, uh, Peak District National Park, thankfully, not London. Um, so um, I can see on both sides there. Are, and the reality is about to, going back to Scotland. Um, we're all Scottish all the creative industries, really. <laughs> we all want to go there. So get ready. Um, no, but in, in a real sense, both in the European union and all the countries i've worked in and live well not lived in but I, I, i'm here a lot in the eu and in the uk it's really important to know that we've, we've got to stop or not to try and avoid anyone putting in a wedge between us because we're all the same we're all the creative industries i don't i know very few there's the roger daltries and the bruce dickinson's and a couple of others i won't mention who maybe don't feel the same way which i don't understand but we must stop this being, being a wedge being put between us and we will but it's really it, yeah, that's yeah. how i feel and i think i think you were asking peter at the, you know what's the benefit is anyone benefiting from brexit the answer is actually we all are because look there's this panel we're all talking <laughs> cross border absolutely <laughs> doing that before. so frankly there are upsides too with this discussion and we're finding solutions so it's, it's got to be positive oh there's a really important question just popped up um, and I'll just say this because it's a lot of confusion. Somebody who's got a French and British passport, you lucky person. If you've got a French passport, it means you are a French citizen. So you have EU citizenship. You can work anywhere. It's wonderful. And if, if you've got residence, though, as a Brit in any one of the EU 27, but not citizenship, I've been asked this a lot the last couple of weeks, you can only work in the host country that you're in and the UK without EU citizenship unless you're a frontier worker, but that's different. So that's a really good question. He's got both passports. So actually, yeah. in his instance, he's fine. Lucky person. Yeah. <laughs> there are lucky persons. Like Irish so uh, anyway. we're uh, slowly coming to an end of this panel. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, fruitful uh, discussion. A lot of things have to still have to be worked out concerning the relation between UK and uh, the rest of the world, I would say. Uh, with COVID around, uh, live music in general is under threat, no doubt. Uh, let's see what Brexit contributes to the mess in the future or which wonderful solutions arise despite everything uh, that we just discussed. If you have any questions, please feel free to send them via chat or as a Facebook comment and we can answer them right now. Uh, for the participants of this Zoom meeting, not Facebook, or right after the end of the session, there will be a short survey coming up to your screen. 
please take a few minutes to answer the questions and to give us some feedback. Thank you very much uh, to Kim, uh, Ian, Daryl and Sebastian. Thank you all for joining Thank us you. on this virtual sessions. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Bye, bye everybody. Ciao. Stay safe. <laughs>